Welcome to APSA Artworks, a four-part series where we're going to introduce you to the fantastic world of the visual arts and how to go about building up an investment portfolio of artworks. We, as the performing artists, the entire arts and entertainment industry, contribute 14% to South Africa's GDP annually. Let your work be visible. Um, invite us to exhibition openings. Share, you know, um, documents. And I'm loving this place. I mean, I'm just looking at this work here that we're going to unpack shortly. What does it mean to be a practicing artist? It means making a lot of sacrifices, of being patient, of being committed to something that won't show immediate results. What I love about art is that you're investing, it's almost like you're buying a stock. We're now at one of the work tables within Lekonolo's studio and this is now where we really get to the meat of, meat of it, if yeah. I can call it that. Welcome to APSA Artworks, our four-part series where we introduce you to the wonderful world of the visual arts and how to go about building up an investment portfolio of artworks. I'm Dr. Paul Bayless, APSA Senior Specialist Art Curator. And today is the fourth and final episode in the series. Once again, I'm extremely excited with today's lineup, as our focus today will be on how to grow your art collection as an investment. I will also be sharing unique, interesting personal collections by some of my APSA colleagues. If you have any questions or comments, please do share these with us, and we will try to address them through today's um, webinar. Our first colleague to share his passion for collecting is, is Yuan. Hi, my name is Yuan. I play music and I collect guitars. I started my music career as a drummer, as you can see. I was influenced in my youth heavily by bands such as Prime Circle, Cutting Jade, as well as Sarin Gas, uh, as they were known back then. Nowadays, of course, called Seether. I collect guitars mainly based uh, on the artists that play them, so signature series guitars or where artists manufacture guitars or they have companies that manufacture guitars. I'll take you through a rundown of my guitars real quick. Firstly, that is a PRS Les Paul model. Uh, that is the signature series guitar from an artist called Zach Myers. He plays for the band The Shinedown. That is a Sigma Walnut guitar. Uh, if you listen to modern blues or rock, uh, as well as some jazz and perhaps some country, You'll have a Sigma or, for those that can afford it, a Martin guitar, which is the parent or used to be the parent company for Sigma at least. That is another PRS Les Paul shaped guitar. Uh, that is the signature series model from a guitarist called Mark Tremonti. Um, arguably my, the, the guitarist that influenced me the most, um, and my music choice and what I play these days. Very heavy rock, grunge, a uh, little bit of metal, um, in there. Uh, Mark Tremonti is a great solo artist, but also played for big bands such as Alter Bridge and Creed in the past. And then lastly, that is an explorer shaped guitar from a brand called Chapman Guitars. Uh, two reasons why I like that guitar. One is it is manufactured or the company that manufactures it is owned by some of the guitarists I admire the most. Um, the, the, the most prevalent of them being Rob Chapman or as the music fraternity knows him, Chappers. Uh, this model was created specifically for him. It's called the Ghost Fret. Uh, and then the Explorer shape, uh, after the X that it represents, made famous in the 80s and 90s by James Hedfield, who's the lead guitarist um, and singer for uh, Metallica. Guitars I would still like to own uh, is a solo guitar uh, that is manufactured by another YouTube guitarist called Ola England. Uh, he has a company called Solo Guitars. Uh, great musician, awesome guy. And then lastly, um, after Rabia Massad, another YouTube guitarist that influences a lot of what I do musically, uh, he has a signature series called The Beer, um, and that's a baritone guitar um, that is also made by, by Chapman Guitars. Thank you so much for listening to me and looking at my guitar collection. Cheers. Thank you, Jean, and thank you for sharing that with us. Um, 
really fascinating and the passion that that comes through as well in terms of your collection and we um, look forward to seeing how you add to that collection in um, the months and years ahead. Our first in-studio guest needs no introduction. Uh, it's someone I met 10 years ago at um, the Car Khan Car Arts Festival in Oatsburn, and it is Khan, the lead singer for the Parlor Tones. Welcome, Khan. Thanks, always good to be here. It's really great, great to have you here. And um, just, what did you think of that collection? Oh, pretty impressive. Um, I think he knows more about guitars than I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, you could probably come and tell me a thing or two about my guitar collection. I also collect guitars, but I, I don't think I know quite as much as he does. I just kind of like them for their iconic shapes and, and if they're old. And you don't use them. I mean, do they just sit there or do they, where, are they on the wall in a c c cabinet? How do you... No, no, I definitely use them. Um, I, I, I wanted to sort of, um, I was explaining earlier, but, you know, shares are, are something that sits in this ether in the internet yes. world and they, they grow in value, supposedly, but you never really get to enjoy them or experience them. So I kind of wanted to take something that I love, which is creating music and um, tangibly get to use yes. it uh, like a guitar. Um, that could potentially appreciate in value, which generally the vintage guitars do, but also document my, my journey as I go along. So I definitely I record with them. Very few of them I do I actually tour with because okay. uh, they're a little bit too precious. <laughs> but yeah, they, 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 they definitely get played and they definitely are used on, on album recordings. Fantastic. I think we're going to have to get you and Jean together at a later date and just swap notes and everything and like have that. Have a solo off. Y <laughs> there we go. And you've also got a passion for the visual arts. Um, you, 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 you've also got a bit of a collection. Um, just share a bit of your journey with us. Um, yeah, so um, I think when I started, well, the first art piece that I collected was a Paul de Toy art piece. Um, and it was quite an organic journey. We, we were doing this show in Cape Town for, um, it's like a charity school called the Zip Zap mm. Circus where um, uh, this, this guy that runs this, this school takes, you know, uh, disadvantaged kids or kids with sort of a checkered background, okay. maybe drug abuse and so on. And he brings them into the school where they learn life skills whilst um, becoming performers, mm -hmm. circus performers. Um, and I mean, they, they tour the world with this particular um, circus. circus. And so it was a, uh, a fundraising event for the school, I think, to build a new school. Okay. And this was in 2010. And what happened is we were performing on stage while all the circusry was happening around us, trapeze wow. artists and clowns. I think we were the clowns. <laughs> and um, Paul de Toya was sort of in the foreground um, painting, uh, I guess, a depiction of what was unfolding on stage. And... Um, there was a dress rehearsal for the media just before the actual event on the night. So we had to obviously get into all our stage regalia. The whole event show went as it would that night and Paul painted this, this painting. And so I went to him afterwards and I said, after the, after the dress rehearsal, and I said, what are you going to do with that painting? And he said, well, I, I was going to give it to my son because it's his birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, and th but then he said, are you, uh, are you interested? And I said, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'm definitely interested. And then, um, and that, that was the first time I'd heard of Paul de Toy. You know, I was meeting mm -hmm. him in that interaction. And I loved the art. I loved that, you know, it was just very out there. And um, yeah, he gave me a price, which was very expensive for me at the time, um, but a lot cheaper than he would commercially have sold yes. it for. So it was a deal. I'm sorry to his son for um, <laughs> buying your <laughs> birthday present and keeping it for myself. <laughs> But yeah, and I have that um, framed and proudly hanging in my house. And it's, I mean, th and that's one of the things we've, we've tried to share with people through our series and that is buy work that resonates with you or you can relate to. And in this sense, you know, as we can feel the passion that comes through as you're sharing the story with um, behind the poor de toy work. And you can almost visualize the trapeze artists, as you say, the clowns, yourself standing on the stage there. And that suddenly becomes a story in itself. And 
very much a, a dinner sort of conversation piece. Yeah, 100%. And I mean, I, I don't think it's anything I'll ever sell or, you know, get rid of in any regard because there is actually a, you know, a, a connection in time to a show that we yeah. did. And, and yeah, subsequent to that, you know, Paul and I became friends and you know, obviously, sadly, he's, he's passed away. But, um, yeah, I guess, since, uh, you know, there's a lot of memory. Yeah. Um, it, it's very person personal, that, that, that artwork. And we were talking prior to this as well. I mean, that work in itself has um, appreciated in value. Um, but that's not the reason why you actually acquired it in the first place. It was really because of your connection to it. 100%. Yeah. yeah. And you've traveled, I mean, you've been fortunate. You've traveled the world. You've performed on global stages. But I mean, but from an art perspective, have you come across any interesting artworks around, you know, that stand out for you as well on your journeys? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, obviously we've toured a lot of Europe and the States and um, what I see a lot of there, which is very cool, and I, I, you start to see it here in, in South Africa as well, is where there's art is on display in the streets and on buildings mm. and kind of sculptures and even as graffiti, um, you know, and, and they're documented and they, they're there, they're fixed, yes. um, but they're very, part, very much a part of the, the culture and the lifestyle for the inhabitants of that city. So that's very cool to see. Um, and whenever possible, um, when I do travel, I try and either buy a trinket or some sort of artwork. Um, and a, a couple of years ago, we were in Nigeria for the MTV Africa Music mm. Awards. And, um, you know, I went into the town to, to look at the sort of art that they had there. And there was this very cool wooden sculpture that this nice. artist had done. Um, it kind of was depicting Atlas holding the, the world on the your whole, on shul uh, shoulders. And um, yeah, so I bought the art, <laughs> and there it is. Uh, um, and, I, and I paid more for the bribe to get it out <laughs> of the country than to the actual artist. You know, as I was checking in this official pitched up yeah. and he had this document that he'd folded 1,300 times and he unraveled it, just illegible. Yes. And he said, ah, you now you're stealing our art. You have to pay a, mm. a fee to get it out of the country. And I was like, oh, well, I mean, I've come this far in terms of acquiring the work. Yeah, I, I thought it was a very fair transaction, yeah. but uh, here we go. Had some dollars and um, I now have it in my lounge. <laughs> and that's a valuable point you raise there because art is a sort of a commodity that um, people can travel as people m move across the world and that. And um, the advice that we, we would say to anyone as well, because we don't want to go down the route that you went, you know, where we um, having to um, pay a bribe and things like that, because not, you know, it's something we wouldn't, you know, advocate from a group perspective. <laughs> and really, I think to anyone buying art, particularly when you're buying from another country, the important thing is to do your homework, to look at what are the, the laws, the regulations and things like that. Even within South Africa, you know, with our South African Heritage Resources Act, you know, if you want to buy a cert, one of the old masters and that, there are regulations attached to it if, if you are a buyer and wanting to take that particular work out the country and things like that. And it's to look to avoid the situation that you, you potentially found yourself in at that time. Yeah, I do, th I do feel some countries, the rules are very, they're not there. They're more kind of getting more invented on the spot. So <laughs> <laughs> you can do all the research you want and it's still fair to curveball. But yes, I do not advocate bribing either. But you've got, the the, you've got the <laughs> treasure that you've now got in terms of, and, and a gem. And I think, again, a work of art and a story behind it that you can relate and share. Our next video shared with me as well, because, you know, we are diversifying a bit out this morning. Besides just looking at artworks is other collections. And as I said at the start, we have asked a number of our employers at APSA to share some of their special collections that they've got with us and our next um, APSA colleague to share um, his collection with us is Mtunzi Jonas, who's responsible for group sponsorships. I'm a sneaker, um, quite chilled, but obviously uh, will be noticed by people simply because it is a, a denim finish. 
A couple of other interesting ones. Uh, this is your Stan Smith. It's an old classic. Uh, started out as a tennis shoe. Has now become a very popular sneaker. Uh, those are quite cool as well. Then came across some interesting vans. Uh, obviously the recognizable Tyson print is something that stood out for me. Again, uh, these are vans, quite difficult to find. Um, but if you look at a lot of your online stores, that's probably the best place to get hold of uh, the latest range of sneakers you're looking at. Then the very last one I want to take you through, uh, these are particularly close to, to my heart. Uh, I had these Nikes uh, custom made in Times Square, New York City, uh, about five years ago. You literally go in, they talk to you about uh, your preferences. You start out with a, a, a sort of a standard model and they customize them for you. So I'll always hold on to these simply because of the memory that, that is attached to them. And uh, it's not just all about, you know, sort of hanging out. Um, if you do want to get on the road, um, I do play tennis. I uh, played a lot when I was younger and rediscovering the love for tennis. And again, you know, moving away from your expected sort of white tennis shoe. Uh, these are fantastic and also some of the striking colors uh, is, what, is what appeals to me. Um, then lastly, uh, it's a very popular Nike sneaker. It's uh, the Air Force One. They come in a wide range of colors. And uh, for me, this gray color with a nice pair of sort of dark jeans uh, works quite well. Um, these are probably my newest pair and probably what I wear the most at the moment. But uh, yeah, got a soft spot for uh, the Nike Air Force One. And uh, very lastly, I'm trying to get through all of them. New Balance, uh, going back to the black. New Balance, these are the 574s. Uh, also a very comfortable sneaker, they look great with a pair of shorts on, 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 a, on an afternoon uh, just walking around and you know a lot of the sneaker brands are playing around with laces and these particular laces stood out for me. And that's just a few of them. Uh, like I said, um, there's probably another 10 or so pairs that aren't here but these are the ones I probably wear the most and what you'll probably see me wearing. Uh, next time you see me. Thank you Mtunzi. And I've known Mtunzi for a number of years and had the honor of working with him and, and have always been fascinated with his passion for sneakers and his knowledge of them as well. And, and to anyone that collects, whether it is art, whether it is sneakers like Mtunzi or guitars like Khan and Jean, it's to also do your homework behind it, understand your subject matter. Don't just have something hanging on the wall for the sake of hanging on the wall, but also understand the history and the journey that each of those works come through. I suppose the one question one has to ask is, well, Mtunzi, how do you keep your sneakers so clean? Because really they are in, in pristine condition there. My next in-studio guest is Ruark Peffers, and Ruark is founding director, senior art specialist, and auctioneer at Aspire Art Auctions. Welcome, Ruark, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Paul. Pleasure to be here. What did you think of the sneaker collection? I thought it was great. I was saying to Khan, in fact, I've got a pair of Stan Smiths. I think they're the mandatory kind of art dealer shoes. If you go, <laughs> if you, if you go to your average art fair, at least about 20% of all the art dealers are donning a pair of Stan Smiths. So, you know, Mtunzi, I can, I can relate. <laughs> and, there, and there is a bit of a link there between the sneakers and art because I know when I spend a day at an art festival going through the fairs and that, there's nothing better than having a good, comfortable pair of shoes and sneakers are actually the best. Absolutely. I mean, spend three consecutive days at an art fair on your feet. I think it's absolutely understandable why sneakers are so popular. And I would imagine the same with you, Khan, on stage. I mean, you yeah, spend in a couple of hours on stage there. Yeah, I also dance in, or dance. My version of jamming on stage is also in sneakers, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, Rook, just to you, I mean, how long have you been an auctioneer for? Sure. Um, Paul, I started fresh out of university, so around 2004 or 5. And during this time, I can imagine you must have come across some um, amazing collections, artworks, Indeed. things like that. Sure, yes. No, I've, been, I've been very fortunate. Um, 
we've seen incredible things in, in, in our time. There were some amazing things in this country, you know, less and less so as they all get kind of farmed out by the bigger companies mm -hmm. who come here and find all, find all sorts of things that they take back to sell abroad, um, leaving more and more of just the South African stuff. But I mean, yes, there's a hugely rich history of, you know, fine art and cultural objects in this country. And I mean, again, like, like Khan and yourself, I mean, you also have a global view in terms of what's happening in the world and yourself within the arts. I mean, how do we stand as visual artists as South Africa compared to the rest of the world? Well, I mean, I can say with my hand on my heart, I think South Africans generally can be very proud of the of the art that we have around us. I think, you know, you can take good South African artists and they can compare to any artist from any country anywhere in the world. And you know the art is at least as good and in some cases I would say I would say better. And you know there's this there's this classic old saying about art, but it says that the more the more complicated the environment, the more difficulties and obstacles a community has, mm -hmm. generally speaking, the better art they produce. And so in a lot of ways, the obstacles that we as a nation need to contend with, they really do feed into the production of fantastic art. And, you know, like I say, we are up there with the best countries in the world. And we need to start celebrating that. I mean, I think as South Africans and uh, as Africans, we need to do more to celebrate the rich talent that... Absolutely, buy more art. <laughs> and support our young artists. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, I mean, in terms of buying art and that. I mean, just can you talk a bit around and share the importance of keeping the documents and the provenance? Because th that's a word that often comes up in mm. the art world is the provenance of an artwork. Sure. I mean, in, in, in terms of, of contemporary art production today, certainly the, the concept of artworks being signed has become quite antiquated. Mm. You know, it's artworks, paintings from previous centuries where the artist would finish it by signing it in the corner. Um, today, your artwork is generally accompanied by a certificate of authenticity. And that is really how you know, you know, if it's a Peter Hugo photograph or if it's, you know, the, the type of thing that can be generally reproduced through mechanical, uh, technological means. Really, the only, way, the only way you have of knowing that it is what it claims to be is through that certificate. So it's hugely important that you retain all the documentation, your invoice from galleries or from the auction house, however you acquire uh, the artwork it's very important that you keep with it whatever it comes with and when i mean yourselves as an and we discussed it very much in our first webinar the difference between the primary and the secondary market and things like that mm. um, yourselves as a spy art auctions you working very much in the secondary market the mm. auction um, market you would also check the provenance of a work and where it comes from before you would put it on auction Absolutely. I mean, the research process is one of the most significant parts of putting together a collection that goes to sale. And I think that really, you know, as with a lot of business, you know, you're only as good as your last deal. Yes. And I think that it's imperative that as an auction house that, you know, you are able to stand by each work that you put on to the market and that you, you know, that you can ensure that it is what you say it is. And I think, you know, it's, and that's one of the things that we've tried to share as well with our viewers and that is the importance of keeping the records, keeping the documentation mm -hmm. around it. One of the questions that our viewers has just asked us is how do you actually look after your collection? Personally, <laughs> you know, I think the, one of the nice things about art, um, you know, in, in, in 2018, it was in fact motor cars that, 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 that as, as a tangible asset, motor cars performed the best mm. over, the, over the period. Um, but, you know, if you compare art to something like motor cars, there's a lot of work and there's a lot of expense that goes into maintaining mm. your E-type Jag or, you know, your Ford whatever Thunderbird kind of thing. So I think um, the nice thing about art is to quite a large extent, you really just put it on your wall and, you know, ensure that it doesn't get wet and doesn't get direct sunlight on it. But for, for, for the most part, it really kind of looks after itself. You know, Khan was saying earlier about, you know, shares. Yes. Khan collects guitars, I collect art because, you know, shares, you have some shares and they sit somewhere, you know, in the ether, we think, <laughs> and something yeah. happens to them. And a few years later, they've either improved or they've decreased. And you don't really, you know, you've got no relationship yeah. with it. There's nothing tangible about it. Um, and the nice thing about having art is you get to see it, you get to enjoy it and interact with it. Um, and, you know, as long as you don't do anything stupid, if I could say, you know, don't put yeah. it in the sun, don't throw water on it, don't, you know, put steam on it. 
um, generally speaking, they're quite easy to look after. And I think just, you know, every five to 10 years, maybe have a professional just look at it and ensure that it's being looked after and that it's not getting too dry or not getting too moist or anything like that. And then really it should be fine. In terms of your guitar co collection, um, Khan, I mean, I would imagine it's quite important in terms of the strings and that as well. I mean, do you have to keep using it to keep the strings almost in shape, um, not in shape, but or from wearing out or because uh, they yeah, just sit there? It's better to play it. I mean, they were built to be played and, you know, the more you play it, the more it kind of feels natural. Otherwise, they kind of do almost stiffen mm -hmm. in, in some regard. And, uh, and obviously the electric guitars have electronics yeah. and everything, in, you know, involved as well. Um, it's quite a difficult balancing act because you can have them serviced, but you've got to ensure that the integrity of the original guitar yes. is always maintained. Um, you know, they don't change pickups or, or too, fiddle too much with the electronics so that if you ever a collector wants to kind of buy that vintage guitar, it's almost as if it, it, it was in its original shape. And, the, and where do you store them? I mean, are they displayed in the open or? They, the some of them are, are still in the cases, but some of them, if, if I know I'm gonna be using them or, or recording with them, um, I, I, I keep them out. And you know, they're there, they're yes. there to be played. Okay. So <laughs> and it, it goes back to that tangible, tactile sort of um, appreciation of, your, of your, your collection or your art. And I think that's, that's as well between, we keep mentioning the idea of a share certificate that sits in a drawer or safe somewhere, where art, um, the guitars, the sneakers of um, Tunzi, those become almost tactile. You know, you get to enjoy your investment at the same time. It's not just necessarily buying because you're gonna be making money out of it, but you, you investing in these items because there's a love for them and a relationship that you, you have with them. Absolutely. I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't have a share portfolio. I think that's a great thing and yeah, def yeah. definitely, but I think <laughs> diversify your portfolio with some art and some guitars. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say to someone, Rook, that um, wants to, that's got a fairly sizable, let's say, art collection, but, you know, wants to now sort of di diversify it and how do they go about um, mixing it up and things like that a bit? So that's something we deal with quite a lot. Um, and in a, in a simple phrase, what we always advise is to trim from the bottom. But I think it's natural, you know, one of my favorite things about art is as you grow as a person, as you mature, as your tastes change, okay. as your outlook on life changes, so too does, you know, the, the art that appeals to you. But when and you I'm going to interrupt. When you say trim from the bottom, just so we, people so, understand so, what... So, so what I'm saying is in terms of quality on the one hand, okay. but also value on the other hand, you know, once you've got... 20 artworks you know you should really focus on the top end of the collection say the five or yeah. ten best ones and then the five or ten lesser ones rather sell those generate some money out of it and then sell five or six artworks to buy one good one for the top end of the collection and therein you 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 essentially trim the collection you make it more focused more concentrated but also it has more inherent value and yourselves as aspired spy art auctions you do advise the clients they can literally come in with their portfolio and say this is what i'm sitting with Absolutely. this is what i'd like to do yeah. and things like that in fact one of the things we like to do which i advise to everybody who's who's aspiring or you know building a collection but i think that you know you should try and get to a place where your collection ultimately becomes more than the sum of its parts. So instead of just having a collection of things that you liked because they appealed to you at the time that you saw them, I think it can be very wise to think of your collection in maybe more, um, you know, more abstract terms and think about what, what it actually is. Um, you know, we've seen some incredible collections. Some people just collect prints between a certain mm. period or, you know, other people just, we have a client who in fact just collects uh, art by women artists post 2000. Um, you know, there's various ways you can do it, but I think it can be very interesting to the collection to make all of the works together about something okay. instead of just, you know, random works accumulated, rather do it with some kind yeah. of thread of continuity between them. And Khan, beside, you've, you've also got a number of other works within your collection. So besides the sculpture um, from Nigeria that we've discussed and the Port de Toy, there are also a number of other works. I mean, your collecting taste, what really appeals to you in terms of the works that you, you look at um, having in your collection? 
Uh, for me, I think it's just aesthetic. If it visually appeals to me and is, is something I'd want to, to put in my house, um, I'll acquire it. Obviously, price dependent. But I, 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 I've never gone that route of going, will this be a good investment? Mm. I've gone, will this look cool in my house? And, and if it does, fit that narrative. Yeah. Some of them, most of them have a personal story. Um, there's a, there's an, a piece, an artwork that our drummer, our drummer paints and I really like his style. So that one of his paintings are hanging in my house. Um, yeah, so there's another one. There was an artist who kind of did a whole, um, I don't know what you call it, but portfolio where she took lyrics from our songs okay, and created yes. a, sort of a visual representation of that, which was quite cool. Um, yeah, and then, you know, there's been times where I've kind of walked past something and gone, oh, that's really cool. Um, uh, I mean, you know, I don't know if you've got the image. It's an artist named Vincent Shingwe, I think his surname is. A very cool style. It's almost like um, that. It's like a Pollock, that artist, where he kind of like takes the, the brush and... Drip painting. Drip painting, yeah. Yes. And then every painting he, he, he sells, there's also a personal attachment to it. So, you know, this one, and he writes a story about what, who these people are. Um, and I think it's kind of, um, it's a, a sibling that raised her, her siblings, you know, obviously you've lost both their parents and uh, she raised her, her younger sisters. And, and that's what this, or that's what the story portrays. But I, I love his style. I think it's amazing. And it's a fairly large work that. Yeah. I mean, that's sizable work. Yeah, so I've run out of wall space. My yeah. house has got many windows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of the things about contemporary art. It gets bigger and bigger. And houses yeah. today, the windows get bigger and bigger. Big, yeah, so yeah. the walls get less and less. So nowadays, people buy two artworks and they're kind of full. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so yeah. by sculpture. <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> what we did um, speak about in um, our first webinars, well, some of the storage, I'd, you know, um, Unfortunate, I do, because of my passion for art, I do have a sizable art collection. You know, one of the things uh, is actually I've acquired storage drawers. So, you know, I, I pack the works away into storage drawers and every three months I can bring out a new artwork, you know, so it looks like I'm redecorating Ooh, the house. Yeah, you know? exactly, yeah. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> and you almost get excited because, in, you know, you're bringing out a new work. I suppose for some people it's a new, could be a new furniture in the house and that for me it's a new artwork on the wall and you get to you know, treat your children equally, so to speak, you know. Mm. As I've also shared with um, each of you th throughout our series um, is I put together through the Apps of Artworks, My Choice Artists for 2020. The, the catalog is available and the link is um, as well. You can see the link on screen. My ask is that you support these artists by investing in the future, investing in the rich talent that we actually have in South Africa and across and across the continent because really as work as also said you know we've got such a, a rich talent that we need to start celebrating our, our artists and you know they can only survive and keep producing work if we do support them all the proceeds from the sale of the artworks um, will go to the artists as well so the next artist that I would like to profile and introduce you to is Patrick Surue. Uh, my name is Patrick Seru and I'm a visual artist based here in Jobek. I'm dedicating this artwork or this piece uh, to a friend of mine, uh, a lady whom I met some years back. Everything we thank God. God, I thank you because I still alive. Yes. But uh, you know what, I thank you uh, because you are a strong woman. Uh, she was a really good friend of mine and uh, by that time she uh, like uh, went through a lot of challenges, obstacles. Uh, those challenges, uh, that she went through by that time, the obstacles, uh, she kept silence about that. Now I'm happy after meeting her, uh, after those years again, that she's happy, she's free uh, from those challenges and she can take care about herself and her children. 
Uh, first of all, uh, when I have like when I getting the idea of what I'm going to do, then I come and uh, I get like a, a sketches or a, like a reference. When I was starting, I got her image in mind and I sketched. Uh, I let deliberately uh, my paint to flow down uh, as a metaphor just uh, to represent uh, those challenges uh, or obstacles uh, that she went through. But not only that, but also positivity that she went through and also uh, I go through into that. Sometimes it can represent tears of joy and also tears of sadness. As you see, my work is uh, mostly about women uh, because I have history with women. As a person, I was raised up with a single mother back home and also to grow up with my three sisters. And I used to spend time with the women and we used to share a lot of uh, stories with them. Some of their stories are really uh, touching. And uh, when I started doing art, I started like uh, bring those stories into my work. And uh, I want to like, uh, bring uh, those stories or emotions onto my canvas uh, just to let the world know also what's happening out there to other people. Thank you, Patrick. And I really would like to encourage you to um, support him, get his work, because in a few years' time, you might be looking back at this and saying, only if I had listened to Paul in 2020, you know. Um, but his work is also so relevant in terms of the subject matter, the role of the woman, the importance of women in our lives, and really actually putting them out there in terms of not on a pedestal, but um, putting them out there into the, um, in, into the public eye in that sense and saying, you know, how many families, children, where the, where the woman is actually the center and what, what holds that, that unit together. Con, I think I would be amiss, and I know it's one of the questions that have come through, so if I don't ask this question, I know some of the people are going to be a bit upset with me. Um, and through your performances, and it is art, it is art. We know, you know, we're not going to debate if it is or not art, because I would regard it as art. But you paint your face and things like that. Why? What, what's the symbolism behind that in terms of your, your performance? Um, I don't think it's uh, cerebral in any regard in terms of symbolism. Um, it kind of organically happened by mistake. We... Years ago, we did a, a birthday party for Cosmopolitan magazine. It was their 21st birthday party, and the theme was we had to dress up, vintage okay. glam, but we were performing. So we dressed up like the guests and uh, did this makeup thing, and then we were like, oh, you know, stage gives you this license to be flamboyant. Um, and at that stage, we were really unknowns, mm -hmm. often on a bill with five other bands or at a festival, and we were like, well, ma maybe this is a way to people might not remember the band name or the songs but they'll go hey there was this band with makeup and uh, they were pretty cool or awful whatever their <laughs> tastes were and um so we uh, would do our own makeup for a couple of years and it was all terrible it looked like a 80s exploded on our faces um, and then we watched the movie called clockwork orange yes. and we we're like oh that's pretty cool it's simple and and mm. uh, you know it's easy to recreate every night um, they just do it on one eye, let's kind of do it on, on both eyes. And that was all s sort of experimental. It wasn't like we sat in a marketing mm. boardroom and said, oh, this will be a strategy that will work. And uh, then people kind of started replicating and coming to shows with the makeup. And we were like, okay, well, now it's a thing. Now we've got to sort of keep it. And uh, yeah, now I'm a. A grown man, I'm a dad to kids, and I still wear some weird stripes under my eyes. <laughs> and, it's, and it's become, almost, as you say, almost signature, you know, to beyond the music, you know, 
it almost gives yourself a visual representation, you know? Yeah, I think our drummer often, I think he sums it up quite well, is it's, all, you know, the, the makeup and the, the, the tie that we wear on stage, it's almost like our uniform, uh, much like a sporting code would have a uniform. That becomes our uniform. And I think some artists or musicians, they, they embody who they are in real life and on stage. Mm. They just are the perpetual eternal artist. For us, you, we almost have to put on an alter ego <laughs> when we get onto a stage mm. environment. And that little kind of subtle thing transports us there and, and hopefully the audience as well. It's almost yeah. like your armor. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. But, but also interesting, wrote that what Khan says, he's, it's evolved or as uh, improved, you know, from when they were doing it to now, you know, and it's the same as in terms of art. When we look at artists, I think one of the things one wants to also look at is to see how the artist's work has Im evolved, the technique has improved through that work through the ages. Completely. I think that's imperative. I think most big collectors, that's one of the most significant criterion that they assess is, you know, is there a constant progression in their work? Um, because, you know, some artists, and I mean, there's many of them who find a recipe that works, mm. you know, it's a certain aesthetic, a certain color scheme, a certain subject, and they just keep doing that for the rest of their life because those are the pot boilers that sell. Um, but those aren't the artists that end up, you know, at the Venice Biennale and that end up being the, you know, prominent artists that, you know, lead thought. Um, and I think if you look at, you know, for an obvious example, but if you look at William Kentridge, what he yeah. was making in the 80s compared to the 90s, compared, you know, compared to his recent show that he just had at Goodman Gallery, which in a lot of ways was kind of the coming full circle because he did what he has said is the last of the films. Um, and he really got famous based on those initial films, which he started in the late 80s. But um, it really does show you that he is a growing, you know, thing and you know what William was mm -hmm. in the 80s compared to now has changed has grown has developed and though there are threads of continuity which I think is also important I think fundamentally is the fact that you know you're not just producing the same thing but that all of those signs of growth and you know to an extent the battle scars that you get in the mm -hmm. way are all imbued in the work that you make as you age and how important is it between the subject matter and the technique within the work I think they need to relate. Um, I mean, I don't think that you could try and, you know, I think art needs to be about something. I think it needs to talk about something or it needs to speak to something. Um, and I think that, you know, everything in an artwork needs to be relevant to what you're talking about. And I think if it's not relevant, it almost shouldn't be there. You should strip it down to its core essentials and the medium needs to correlate or needs to respond to what the artwork yes. is about. Um, I think that it's very important, and certainly in, in this day and age where we're very much about, you know, gender identity, um, very much talking about the types of things that we're talking about now in terms of our post-colonial theory and those types of things. I think that to a large extent, you know, the traditional medium of oil on canvas isn't really the most suitable medium to talk about gender-based violence or to talk about, you know, literally the planet that we live in mm. today. Um, I think the mediums that are coming out now, you know, it's a lot more performative, it's a lot more video based, it's a lot more installation based. And I think that artists are being hugely creative in what mediums they access to talk about what they're talking about, because it really is, it's, it, it's part of what they're saying. So true. And I think it's also, it's very interesting as a country, as we've changed, you know, and the history that we've gone through, it comes through very much, you know, in terms of both the music that the musicians have played an important role and also the artists, you know, in terms of bringing to the fore where we find ourselves as a society. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a huge music fan and I, I have to say, if I look at, you know, I'm, I'm a bit older now. Uh, when I was a teenager, you know, kind of in the 90s, listening to the music, the, the quality of production and, you know, fast forward 15, 20 yeah. years, the quality of production of the sound that comes out of this out of this continent, quite frankly, is just remarkable, you know, and I really feel that, you know, it makes you proud to be African because we really are at the forefront of the most interesting in, in everything, you know, like mm -hmm. a lot of the rest of the world have really had their time to shine, you know. 
Um, and I think that most of the interesting content that's being produced really is from Africa or of Africa, you know, related to what we're doing here in terms of sound, in terms of, you know, art, form, all sorts of, all sorts of the creative, you know, cultural things. I really think we're at the, at the crest of, of, a, of an important wave. And the, uh, the global stage is almost looking at us appeal you know because there is Absolutely. that wanting more of more of africa exactly and also back collecting to a large extent because a lot of institutions yeah. you know in the previous century nobody bothered collecting art from africa because they called it primitive and they called it you know all these different disparaging mm. terms um, and now they're starting to realize how important it was, it is, how significant, how relevant it was. I mean, a lot of Pablo Picasso's best art yeah. was based on what came out of this continent. And now academics are revising what they were thinking a hundred years ago. And now these major global institutions are frantically trying to backpedal mm. and, you know, fill gaps in their collections and act like it was always there, <laughs> you know. But it's, um, it's, it's quite nice for us because it, it, it presents an amazing opportunity for this continent because, you know, if you're shopping in, in dollars and euros and you're buying art from us, you're hugely yeah. advantaged, you know. True, so true. Let's look at our last two videos that our APSA colleagues have shared with us today. Hi, folks. This is Sam Resch from the CSO. And today I just want to share my superhero and science fiction figurine collection with you. So... Lots of Marvel Avengers stuff and a whole diorama of the different Avengers from Infinity War. And then we've got a wise collection of Wonder Woman figurines. She's a big Wonder Woman fan. And then we've got some DC heroes as well. And one of my favorite Avengers, Iron Man, has his whole little nook here and some swatted other figurines. In addition, I'm also a huge Star Wars fan. So you can see the running out of shelf space here. Uh, these are just Star Wars collectibles from across the different movies and different timelines. Uh, and my favorite character from Star Wars is obviously Darth Vader. I spent a lot of time collecting some of these. So yeah, there Hi, you go. Uh, I'm Sandro Buccineri. I'm the Chief Security Officer for the group. Uh, the team has asked me to share uh, some of my, my collections with you uh, because I keep seeing it in my backgrounds when I'm on, on Teams calls or Zoom calls. Um, and I thought I'll share some of that with you. I, I have an absolute love for travel. Um, I've, I've been very blessed and very fortunate to travel the world. And these are just some of the collections that I've, I've done over the years. Uh, this, this collection dates back to about 2011 when I first started collecting mugs used to be magnets before that uh, and Starbucks has a great series called Where in the World. Uh, they have countries and cities. I decided to do cities because I can collect a whole lot more mugs um, and these are just a, a small sample of the collection that I currently have. Quite a few mugs have broken over the years as we've moved continents uh, but that's all right. Uh, just it's a, more another excuse to, um, to essentially get more. Wow. Two interesting collections and very diverse. I mean, Khan, your impression? Um, the, the, the toy collection or the little pop heads as they're called, um, our drummer does the same thing. Um, and uh, our ex-roadie. Um, and they, funny enough, do appreciate in value. Wow. I mean, some of them you've, you've maybe bought for 250 Rand. You can sell them for five grand. So um, I actually call those kind of things, even Lego to an extent, it's it's toys for adults um, mm. and you know if, if people that know about it much like sneakers often buy one to, to keep in the box that they can maybe sell in 10 years yes. time um, and then one that they can assemble and and I think what they have done well is they kind of tap into nostalgic pop culture because mm. often those are there'll be a he-man figurine or a, a, the gremlins figurine which takes you back you know in time and i mean if i just mentioned that brings back the 80s i'm, yeah. I'm starting mm -hmm. to feel a bit old now you know yeah and lego's been very clever with that yeah. they'll have ghostbusters themes or back to the future themes and of course all these sort of grown men go out and collect it and assemble it and yeah they they do they do appreciate and value but as you also as we've also said it's it's how you research your subject and get to know your subject matter yeah. Because, I mean, you d the each of our employees here have 
as well got a wealth of information in terms of behind it and the stories behind it and the passion that they speak with around the collections. We've got um, a, another question and um, it comes through to us is how can um, artists, visual artists get involved? You know, we have so many artists that are unemployed that I think particularly during the lockdown and that are struggling to get their name, get their works out and get their brand. And um, we did touch on this in our previous webinars as well. And one is artists today are very much more fortunate than let's say where we were 10 years ago in terms of social media. One of the things I've enjoyed um, as a curator is spending hours on Facebook and that going through other artists and where they've and I've discovered a richness of talent over the last few months where artists have used social media and such as Facebook, Instagram, and so on to put their, their works out there. And I would say to young artists, do that. That's the one um, opportunity. The second is to look for various platforms to get your brand and your art out there. Well, one of those platforms is um, art competitions such as the Absol Atelier. It is an annual competition. Next year is the 35th year of the Latelier, enter it, get your works, um, get your name out there. Because as we say to people, if you don't jump in the ring, you can't then say, you know, no one noticed me. So get into that ring, put your works and use the various opportunities that are there. Um, we are getting to, to the end. I mean, we could continue talking for hours. Um, but just to my... Um, Guests, really a big, big thank you both to yourself, Khan. I know you're incredibly busy um, as well. So thank you very much for taking time out from your schedule um, to, to join us today. To Rook as well. Um, I know we've kept you going off on holiday. I know you're going to be heading off shortly. Um, but really, before we just close off, um, Khan, any last thoughts from yourself? Um, not really. I think we've covered a lot of topics. I, I, I think um, the, the concept of art is very broad, and it should be. I don't think there's any defining rules. Uh, you know, one man's art is another man's junk, and vice versa. And, um, you know, as long as it resonates with, with the collector, that's all that counts. Thank Shouldn't you. be a judgy, convoluted uh, you know, space. And there's no right or wrong. I think yeah. it's appreciating what there is there and the diversity. Of, you know, everyone has their own unique style, taste, and that. And it's just appreciate. It's the same as music. Some music talks to some people and others, you know, doesn't. Exactly. Rook, yourself, any final comments? Uh, Paul, no, put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> I think, I think um, if anything should have come out of these sessions, I think, um, you know, really the, the abiding sentiment, the most important thing, you know, and I say this to all South Africans and, you know, really to the world, but we are exceedingly fortunate to be positioned where we are in this country with the art that we have around us. Um, and I know that to a lot of artists and a lot of, you know, gallerists and academics, you know, the, it's, it's almost a swear word to talk about the the investment potential. And, you know, I'm reluctant to, to say that I'm probably going to find my car scratched when I get home. But, you know, really, we do have incredible art that is getting made in this country. And, you know, even in my career, I've, you know, been 15, 20 years in it. But I remember in my early days, the first picture I ever bought was the princely sum of 1800 Rand. And I sold it a couple of years ago and made more than 20,000 Rand. And, you know, PNF lino cuts, I always find them a very good example. But you could basically give those things away in the 90s. Um, and now they're hugely valuable and it was over quite a short period of time um, and I think if you look at the contemporary artists specifically the youngsters making art mm -hmm. in this country today you know I'm talking about the 25 to 40 year old artists there's remarkable talent there um, you know go and do your research go to exhibition openings go to JAG go to you know all the institutions and just try and get out there as much as you can and try and educate your eyes best you can and then buy art um, you know, I think that you really stand so much mm -hmm. to gain from it. Not only, you know, you become a very important part of the ecosystem. You know, art collectors are as important as artists because without the collectors, the artists yeah. wouldn't be able to sustain. Um, and it's really a whole, it's a whole ecosystem and everybody's part of it. And I think that, you know, yeah, just, just go out and engage and, and, and enjoy and absorb all of the brilliant, you know, art we have. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Khan. And really... I, sh I share that sentiment to 
to each of you. Um, we need to celebrate, we need to support South African artists, both our visual artists and our musicians as well. You know, they, we have such, such a rich talent on, on this continent and we need to start spending time and immersing ourselves in the culture that we have locally and not always just look towards the Northern Hemisphere and so on. So um, my last call out to each of you is support our young artists, Go look at the catalog. Um, each artwork on the catalog has a unique number. Uh, and then just drop us an email um, at gallery at um, apsa.africa and let us know which work you are interested in. Acquire it and we will ship that work to you as well. And as I said, the money will go, or all, all, all the proceeds from the sale will go to supporting the artist. So to each of you that have joined us um, over the last, just today and over the past month, um, thank you very much. We've appreciated your comments, your questions. And unfortunately, as I said, this is the last episode of APSA Artworks for 2020. Um, and where we've been able to introduce you to the wonderful world of the visual arts, where we celebrated our rich local talent. We've got to meet some, some of the, our interesting guests to each of them that have been part of this. A big, big thank you. So until I see you again in 2021, stay safe and goodbye.